Hey, everybody. This is Bevan. Welcome to Bevan, a femme over 40 and her friends podcast. I'm your host, Bevan. I've said my name three times. It's time to start the show. My co-host, Biscuit Reynolds, is with us in spirit. And um, I tried so hard. I just want to say, if you're not watching the visual episode, there's like a window behind me and it's got this like incredible mountain view with like snow-capped Mount Olympus, that kind of thing. But you can't see it. Sadly, I just tried so hard to like wrestle a spot in front of that window that would give you a little peek, but that's all good. Um, I just am so sincerely grateful that you're here with your time, treasure, and talent. And you're here to listen to me with Jonathan Co. I met Jonathan in the Akashic Mentorship uh, cohort uh, taught by Leah Garza. And Jonathan is just a tender, beautiful, amazing human. I'm really excited to introduce you to Jonathan. And um, before we get started, I just want to say this is episode 174. I did publish episode 173, but I did it on Patreon specifically because it just felt too vulnerable and tender as a solo episode. I like to talk from the scar, not the wound. And um, it just, it was a recent trauma healing I went through. And so I just wanted to share that process because I know for me, witnessing other people's processes and how they like approach healing. Um, and it very much felt like a puzzle I put together. And then I was like, oh, this and this and this and this. Um, and so I wanted to share that process, but it just felt too tender to go public. So it's in my Patreon page, which is the best way to support this podcast. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is a membership support site, which allows folks like you to support creators like me who create work that you find valuable. Um, my page is patreon.com slash FKDP, which stands uh, for Fat Kid Dance Party Aerobics, which is my aerobics class for anyone who feels left behind by mainstream fitness. If you've ever been called too much, too fat, or felt too awkward to dance, mine is the supportive class for you. Every episode, every episode, every uh, Zoom class I teach is available for my members. So you can join and party with us anytime. I also have an on-demand membership, which is like my joy to serve. I record my live aerobics classes that are in person and I record like various other classes um, and put them up on the membership. There's like far more than 20 classes available to you at any time. And I rotate them out and um, it's really, I'm just so grateful to get to teach these classes and that some of them just exist and they existed at the time that they existed and some of them get recorded. And so just grateful to serve. And it also supports all my other artistic free offerings in the world. So I have a blog, queerfatfem.com. It's free, free 99. Uh, and then I also have this podcast, which is also free because it's really like on my heart to help people understand all the various uh, wonderful ways there are to be a happy, successful adult. And Jonathan and I really get into this idea of like, what is success? And what is, what do they in quotes say is success versus like, how are we determining success for our own selves? And um, anyway, I hope that you enjoy this episode. Thanks for tuning in. And I'm just grateful that you're here. Welcome to the podcast, Jonathan Co. Thank you, Bevan. I am so excited. I have been looking forward to this. And I don't know, each time I sit with you, it's just you are a ball of sunshine, my friend. So thank you for oh. existing. And I feel so honored to be here. Thank you. I too have been looking forward to this. Like, I feel like there's a lot of good chemistry we have, like intellectually and like spiritually and yeah. emotionally and like astrologically, astrologically, all of those things. Um, and I am, oh, I'm so thrilled to just share you with everyone. And Jonathan, let's start. I always like to start business in the front. Will you tell us like what you offer in the world? So how folks can interact with you? Oh, cool. Yeah, I remember listening to your conversation with Leah Garza, who is um, our mutual mentor. And I, I yeah, I, that question was like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, I do astrology readings. Um, I do divination readings. And I also do what I'm calling subtle realm alchemy, which is essentially like a blend of Akashic work, energy work, and hypnosis because I was also trained in hypnosis um I have a podcast called healing the spirit which you are going to be on um I show up every Monday it's my favorite offering to be honest with you it's like it's 
free. You can just tune in whenever you want. I talk about the astrology, but um, what I like to say is astrology like breaks my mind. You know, I feel like each time I look at the astrology, I end up talking about like whatever I end up talking about, you know? So um, I guess I'd say that if you are the kind of person who is curious about astrology, but is willing to be to have your hand like taken by someone and then um you know fall down the rabbit hole together then i i might be your astrologer <laughs> but if you want like okay step one step two step three i may not be the best um so yeah i don't know i don't know why i'm starting with like a um like this is it, you might be a good fit for me <laughs> if you are blah 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 or not but anyways yes that's what i offer uh yeah i, I think say, at this moment you're a mercury and pisces so i would just say if you feel the vibe just book with john totally totally that's <laughs> it yeah it's like the vibe i feel like people catch my drift and also there's a certain level of um so i'm a virgo rising pisces sun gemini moon and so i feel like you're kind of um playing the lottery when you're hanging out with me because you don't know which side you're going to get you know like there's a and for some people that may be amazing and for some people it's like what is this what is going on so yeah okay so like me and many other Virgo risings you have a Gemini midheaven which like is yeah. also the I think it's like the multi-career placement like mm -hmm. you're just going to offer a lot of things and just I, I can't even distill myself into one thing I do anymore. I've really released the idea of my job as my identity and like, sure, sure. right. Like, cause I, totally. I, I need my days to be different every day. You know, like I just, I have one job that's like the same once a week on Mondays and it's actually really anchoring. It's like almost ritual. It's like that it's, this is the one day that's the same, you know? And yeah. so it's, it's Sundays too, kind of, well, not anymore. now I'm doing living systems on Sunday mornings sometimes. So it's like, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's ritual too. You're we talking about Scorpio yeah. third house too, because we both are Scorpio third house babes. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So Jonathan, that's what you offer, but also you are a musician. Yes, I do offer music as well. If that's something you're interested in, I have um, released music under my own name, but I've also released music under a moniker in the past. Um, Nate Chi as an N-A-T-E and then the last name is Q-I um, and so yeah if you probably it might be easier for folks to uh, google elementary love which was the name of the album and you'll find it it's somewhere in there in the universe on the spot in the universe yeah yeah that's so interesting I feel like the um the music industry is so fundamentally different now than it was even 10 years ago and certainly yeah. than 30 years ago. Yeah. I don't even know if there's like an industry anymore. I mean, clearly there is because there's like Taylor Swift, but I think at this point, you know, um, music is, I'm struggling to find the right words for it. I think music is a passion for me it's maybe a little bit um, grand to say, but I think music is like my reason for existence. And I, I recently came to the realization that I cannot live an existence where I don't do music and where I don't devote my life force energy to like have a robust musical practice. So for me, I'm really doing it for my own sanity, first and foremost. And then if anybody wants to listen, it's like, well, great. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about my aerobics class. Like, it's like yeah. I the thing I, I once I realized, oh, my God, I'm supposed to be a fat aerobics instructor. What? Um, And then I just started doing it. And I was like, well, I'm going to work out like three times a week, at least for the rest of my life. Yeah. Might as well, like bring people along on these journeys. And I have a lot to teach. And I know it's more effective to teach while people are moving. So like here we go. You know, like, yeah, it really is my reason for living and like my passion and the thing I love to share. And yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it, Jonathan. And like, I think in this day and age, just like, it's, 
people like Taylor Swift aside, like if you want art to exist, it's up to the patrons, you know, like mm. we're not in like rich people days where like a lord or a lady would like be a patron to an artist. It's like, you know, $5 at a time makes someone able to create art. There's a musician I like who said I can draw a direct line from the support that I have received on Patreon to the art I'm creating today. And mm. well, same for me. And like, mm. Yeah. So I think yeah. like your music is your offering. What is, tell me more about like your music practice. Like yeah, the thing that is your gift from God and like your raison d'etre. So like, what is your, like your ritual or your routine around yeah. showing up to it? Well, it's shifted a lot over the years. I um, grew up studying piano. Um, that was my first instrument. And for me, it's, it's funny because I was always like, I always know myself to be a singer, mm -hmm. but I actually didn't take voice lessons until I was 29, which was really, really late in life. Um, although, you know, it's not too late, but it's like, it's pretty late in life, especially given my musical backgrounds. And um, I think to answer your question more directly, back in my childhood, I was always practicing and I even went to conservatory. Like I went... Uh, to music school for um, six years and I was practicing like very intensely and very in a very focused way and at the time I didn't fully conceptualize it as such but I think I was really burned out after the end of that six years so by 2013 I just I couldn't do it anymore and I was like I had to I had to leave I ended up taking um going back to school for economics, actually. And then I ended up uh, landing my current day job as an actuary. And in 2019, I released my first album. And I had this whole fantasy in my head that like, oh, I'm going to release my singer-songwriter album. This is the um, like realization manifestation of an old childhood dream and it's going to change my life like I'm going to be able to quit my job I'm going to be able to like go on a tour and all that and none of that happened and so that actually ended up bringing me to astrology I ended up getting very serious about my spiritual practices um, I also grew up in church so there was a whole other backlog of like some sort of spiritual training that wasn't formal but was very regular um and I would say that for a while the only solid musical practice I had was every week I would show up I paid for voice lessons with my teacher um and we just show up and sometimes I get some time to practice sometimes I don't <laughs> and we just show up and we just sing and recently, I've kind of recommitted to my musical practice. And what I've been doing, Bevin, is interesting because I've, I think throughout my life, I've always had this really strong relationship with practice, like first practicing the piano. And then once I got really into my meditation practice, I was meditating and doing energy work every single morning. And recently, what I've been doing is I actually started my day making music. Like I just sing, I just make noises with my voice and it's, I can say that I can really feel the difference. I don't know what the difference is, but I feel much more myself. And uh, yeah, so I think long story short, my current practice is I sing every day. I use my voice. I move around different registers of my voice and that's it. <laughs> Do you play piano every day? Uh, I try. I try. Um, piano is different. I have a totally different relationship with piano because I actually went to school for it. And, you know, I like to say that sometimes the more you know, uh, the more blocked you are. <laughs> yeah. You know, so um, I feel like it actually took me a long time after I was done with music school to reapproach the piano with more curiosity and less judgment and recently that's been the case like I've been back at the piano and just like letting myself 
like I, I now ask myself, what do I want to do at the piano? And I follow that. You know, and sometimes that looks like practicing Bach or Beethoven. And some other times it looks like just noodling around for like 15 minutes. And yeah, I used to have this very regimented practice um, routine and it was very targeted. It was a, it was all about like, how can I get myself to that point where I can perform really well at like a certain caliber? And now I'm just like, eh. <laughs> I'm just playing the piano. Yeah. That's a beautiful shift. I think, um, you know, there's something for us Virgo Risings about like releasing the need of rigidity and opening up to yeah. and curiosity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's totally. Uh, I love it. And also Jonathan is part of my very favorite little micro generation of 1989 to 1991 with the Capricorn outer planet stack, but then mm -hmm. also a Mars and Capricorn like me. And so it's just like, I find when you have strong Capricorn placements, your childhood ends up being a mature childhood. Like even I see this in my my friend's kid who's a Capricorn. Like she is just, you know, a little baby grown up, you know? And so like, I think you realize there's like a second childhood you have, like, cause it's never too late yeah. to have a second ch happy childhood. But like also like, you know, learning play is something like play comes easy for other kids and did not come easy for me. And so yeah, here we are. Exactly. Exactly. I think that both you and I, Bevin, just by, you know, by virtue of our charts, right, share, obviously, we're both Virgo Risings. And then um, our fifth house is ruled by Capricorn. And we both have Mars in the fifth house, right? And one of the ways I conceptualize an exalted planet, traditionally, which Mars is in Capricorn, is that exalted planets feel a lot of pressure to perform up to a certain standard and so um you may have learned I, I don't know if this was true for you but i think for me it was true where this ability to like strategize and this ability to like get results was like super intense in my personality and in some ways, you know, I look back and I, I had a period where my story around it was that like, oh, my parents really projected their own um, desires for success onto me. But I don't think it's totally true. I think there's a collaboration there because, yes, they may have projected something onto me, but I also played into the projection, you know, for whatever reason. Um, and there's also some relationship with Saturn, like you have Saturn on the ascendant i have saturn domicile in the fifth house like really close to that mars so um yeah there's something about like structure and like learning about self-authority that i feel is like a, a lifelong theme for me does that feel like that for you too absolutely it's interesting because yeah. like i also have that virgo north node so mm. like structure is actually really good for me it's good to create containers but I also can't be rigid in it. It's everything is balanced. Like, you know, yeah. one thing I've certainly been challenged to learn with Leah Garza is like, it's not either or it's like both and neither, neither, nothing matters. Right. Like, <laughs> it's like whatever it needs to be to like create harmony, but like, um, I, you know, my Pisces South node, like I'm very good at just floating around in dreamland. Um, but I, I think I fought that for so many years that like, when I was healing burnout, which I don't even think I was aware at the time that that's what I was doing. I was just kind of like releasing the need to toil and laying around on the forest floor when I moved up here and like the quarantine hit and like the world shut down. And I was like, can't the world stay shut down for a while? I'm not done healing. <laughs> uh, Man. You know, I don't have strong Gemini placements except for my midheaven. So like, you know, like I don't need to talk to people in person right now. Um, but it's it's all good. It's all good. We heal enough. Yeah. But yeah, so I feel like structure, like I, I was telling you this during the pre-show, um, because our chart ruler, which I didn't even know or understand until like last year when Jana of Feeling Loudly was telling me, um, mm. like she was like your chart. She does these cool readings where she'll like go through and help you understand days of the week and like yeah. where where your workflow is the most harmonious with like Ooh. planets. 
Uh, and she was like, your Mercury and Sagittarius is your chart ruler. And I was like, it's not Saturn. It's Saturn's right there on the ascended. I'm a Capricorn. It's ruled by Saturn. She's like, yeah, but you're Virgo rising. So sorry, it's mm-hmm. Mercury. Because you look at the the, ri- the ruling planet of your rising sign. And so you and I, as Virgo risings, are ruled by our Mercuries. And mm-hmm. both of us have Mercury in its detriment, which yeah. you taught me, actually. The detriment is just like where it's a challenging sign for that <laughs> planet to be in. But I actually think my Mercury in Sagittarius is extraordinary. Like, it's where my flair yeah. comes from. It's like Sagittarius is like clown energy. It's like um, the hype person of the Zodiac, the one that like yeah. wants to have the party and like throw the party, right? Uh, maybe not throw the party, but like, could it, I think parties thrown by Sagittarians are good parties, so... Totally. It's like, I feel like Sagittarius is, uh, well, you know, that Kesha lyric of like, the party don't start till I walk in. I feel like that's yeah. like very Sagittarian. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. And then of course, the Sagittarian is going to leave whenever they feel like it and not say goodbye. Yes. Um, right. They're just like, I'm done. Bye. But like Sagittarius, like it's when Thanksgiving happens in or so-called Thanksgiving uh, happens in the United States, which is a feasting holiday, right? Like it's a time for gathering like you just notice like what like astrology is to be experienced and not believed right like just look at how we structure the time of the year like that's a time of great feasting and partying and gathering right and then you get into Capricorn where you're like going within and like rooting in and snuggling up for the winter but like my Mercury and Sagittarius understanding that as my chart ruler and that like every day my Mercury and Sagittarius needs some expression Mm -hmm. life-changing and like and it's like in many ways, I feel like this healing burnout was like going from letting my Saturn and Virgo drive the ship to letting the actual natural captain of the ship, which is my Mercury and Sag, like go. And they, and that's the thing that's always delighted people. It's like the thing that makes me iconic and memorable is like mm-hmm. who I am and how I communicate and how I make people feel. Yeah. Uh, tell me about your experience with your Mercury and Pisces. Well, first of all, I just want to respond to that first, Bevan, because that is so astute like that observation is like so it's like gold because um even for me and I do astrology I guess professionally um I get into the illusion that all these other planets are like the final determinants in my chart and it's always like consistently I found that coming back to my Mercury in Pisces has really given me back like my mojo. Like it's, it's the thing that opened the path back up, you know, because it's almost like the way I like to think about it is this, right? I like to think about the rising sign as like the path that we're walking in this lifetime. Like it's really about like the quality within the quality with which we approach the unfolding of our lives. Right. And therefore that becomes the path right? Because the quality, it's like, you know, you and I were talking about chili right before this this call. Like, if you put a lot of chili on your food, then your food becomes spicy, right? So it's the same thing with like um, the rising sign. Like the quality of your rising sign is like how your whole path is set up. And therefore, um, once you bring awareness to it, you start living the, the in, in a way, like the way that you should, you know? I mean, I, I don't really like how deterministic that sounds but I found that to be true and with the ruler of our ascendant um they're really like the the driver of the car you know so sometimes it's like I I like to think of this in terms of like a truck right if you if there's a, a huge truck and or or like maybe like a party bus maybe that's a better example like let's say there's a party bus and you know, it's currently going in a certain direction and you want to change the direction, you need to talk to the driver. You can't just talk to the celebrity that's inside the car because even if your car, even with, you know, if that party bus has like a bunch of celebrities in it, right, you can talk to them, but they're not the driver. They may have power and influence in other areas of life or like other places. Like once you get to the Met Gala, you know, you start talking to Rihanna, right? But if she's at the, the mega, gr- she was not. I don't. I don't think she was. <laughs> not this year, at least. This year. But I do think that if you want to figure out like how to have a better ride, you need to talk to the driver. So in that sense, um, like for example, in your in your chart, right, or in both our charts, 
Mars is exalted in Capricorn, and so Mars is very powerful, right? So you might find throughout your life that you feel this need to um, be very martial, because when you are showing up in a martial way, you get the results you want. But I like to think of these other planets, especially the strong ones in our charts, more as like a hack, you know? It's like you get to call that friend who's like really powerful um, to help you open up some doors, right? But once you get into the door, you have to get remember that you are this mercurial being because that's probably what's going to help things be sustainable for you. Like another way to think about this is like your rich uncle, right? Like you can call your rich uncle, like I have Saturn in domicile, like daddy's rich, you know? And like, I can call him and be like, yo, help me out with this thing, right? But then if I forget that the the one who really kind of drives the whole ship is my Mercury in Pisces, then chances are, you know, I might um, not enjoy the journey very much. Mm. you know and it feels like i am a, a character in like somebody else's movie yes i feel like in many ways like when we're not living in integrity like with who we're meant to be we're living someone else's movie for us mm -hmm. someone else's yeah. good idea for our life which isn't actually where we're meant to be um right. and then thinking of saturn because saturn is the daddy of the zodiac my my saturn in virgo is like daddy is stressed <laughs> And daddy is a perfectionist. And so daddy's like, making a lot of lists. Yes. Yes. Daddy is making lists and I've got to do all the things on the list. Like, oh my God, what a tremendous healing I had when I was like in my early thirties, I just started working the Al-Anon program and I realized that all the lists that I made for myself, like the to-do lists that were for today, and I could never finish them because I would put things on a list that no human could do in a day, let alone me. And like, now I have three things on my to-do list every day. Like it is short and sweet and prioritized. And I, yes. I peace like in spending time, like I was just telling you in the pre-show, like I, yesterday I spent like a swath of time laying under a willow tree and smoking a joint and just being, and like not being stressed about things. Even though I had responsibilities time blocked around I like also time blocks that time to just lay around and do nothing. Cause like we need it, you know, and so important. we're not taught to do that. I can't wait to like, when I have kids, I'm going to teach them all these things. Like I'm going to teach them all the things. Like a lot of people get really hype about giving their kids the things they didn't have. But I think the more important thing is teaching them the things that you had to learn. Cause like, I want my kids mm -hmm. to stand on my shoulders and have a better life than me. And um, also like, I think like, healing from these older generations like the boomers like are really pissed that like the young like gen z is not for professionalism right like they're not for this oh, status quo. they're not doing things the way it's always been done and i think in some ways like pluto in libra which is my my pluto generation like has been very much like just making like just doing it like everybody else like okay we're gonna do it but then like we yeah. get these like pluto and scorpio millennial side eye like what's been going on and then pluto and sagittarius is the early 20s people right now and they're just not gonna do it and so like mm -mm. the boomers are mad because like they like kowtowed to authority and they want to be kowtowed to and nobody is following their authority and <laughs> you know like hey boomer this is why your kids don't talk to you because you're mean and like you mm. like just because you took the abuse from your your parents does not mean you get to be abusive to your kids or your grandkids. Yeah. They're not going to talk yeah. to you. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it's it, we're in this incredible revolution where I think it's just so important to remember that we want to make our kids proud of us, mm -hmm. not our parents. And just remember yeah. the forward looking, like we did not come here to fix a broken world. We came here to create the world of our dreams. Totally. I also hear your Saturn and Virgo in that share bevin because <laughs> saturn and virgo is like saturn ruled by the trickster you know it's like saturn looking to mercury right and um to me the power of saturn and virgo is actually in understanding and discerning which rules apply when mm. like it's not about blindly following all the rules it's about like applying the right rules at the right time yeah you know? I also like the motivation, um, like our motivation for life comes in our rising sign. And mm -hmm. I love the Virgo motivation for service. Like I just, mm -hmm. 
I'm motivated to do things because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and mm. like, because I want to be of service to the planet and mm. bring my gifts to the world and like exactly. not hide myself the way, you know, you know, they like the, the air quotes, they like want us to hide. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, let's talk about success. Cause you had a really <laughs> good, um, everyone go follow Jonathan Co on threads, uh, Jonathan <laughs> dopamine hits of getting likes on threads. And so it's Jonathan Co official. Unlike all the other fake Jonathan Co's, there's one official Jonathan Co. <laughs> <laughs> K-O-E. Um, but you had a great thread that, um, I just love when people ask for what they need. And you said, I like the dopamine hit in your caption. And so I'm like, done. I'm, I'll fo I follow like now four people on threads and you're one of them. Like, <laughs> uh, it, I just decided on threads that was going to be the social media I kept right and tight. Like, I don't need to follow everybody. I'm just following these four people who matter to me and are doing good, good threads things. Um, mm. Anyway, you said a good thing about like, um, consider if you're not like it's a metric of success and I'm putting that in air quotes, like that you want it to be that like, maybe it's, it's either like the market's not ready for what you have to offer, which like in Chani's book, she says in the intro, she's like my career, like what I'm doing for my career now didn't exist like 10, 20 years ago. So like, yes. am I a late bloomer or was the world just not ready for me yet? Mm. And mm -hmm. so I, I really felt that. And also, so like understanding like the market might not be ready for what you're offering and also that like, maybe it's just a growth area for you to learn more about communication and how to talk yeah. to people about what you do and what you offer. Right. And like, that's not at all a value statement on who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. And so I feel mm -hmm. like Jonathan, I got from that a lot of like your process around like, what is success and like mm. what that means to you. So opine about success. Tell us more. Yeah. Hmm. Let me see where I want to start with this. I think I'm just going to start by saying that I love success as much as anybody else I know. Like, in fact, my North Node, oh, sorry, my South Node in Leo is all about being celebrated and like shining so bright and like having everybody kind of like be like, wow, Jonathan, you are so amazing. And Part of my path in this lifetime has been really affirming myself as a creative. Like I didn't come from a household of artists or people who like lead with their creativity. And yet one of the few things I know about myself from like day one was that I'm a creative person. And like the process of affirming that has been really difficult. And Looking back, I think part of why it was so challenging was because I always equated my uh, creativity, how valid my creativity is, which is such a weird thing, right? Like, why do we even have to even ask, like, whether our creativity is valid? Like, clearly it's there, you know? Like, it, its existence is proof of its validity. And there was also something about you know, the, the upbringing that I had and um, my ancestral lineage that, you know, it was really hammered to me from a very early age that if you want to do something, you better be good at it. You better have success because otherwise you won't be able to do the thing, right? And time when and time again- you better have success, what did they mean by that? You better be able to make a lot of money doing the thing that you say you love. You better uh, get a lot of critical acclaim or like authority approving you, right? And you better have a lot of following basically, right? And like, these are very uh, almost like unquestioned metrics of success that we have in our culture, right? Like money, how much money are you making? Um, are the authorities you know, putting a seal, a stamp of approval on your thing. And then like, are the masses liking it? You know, are there, are there a bunch of people following you, right? And what I've, okay, so this is related, Bevin, to like what I was telling you about um, being a Mercury in Pisces person, because I I wish this weren't the case. Like there's a part of me that wish this, this weren't part of my life, but I've had to transition out of, 
one profession or like one passion into another so many times in this lifetime like a little bit too many times <laughs> for my own liking um and part of it had to do with like the fact that I just couldn't make it work in terms of like being able to pay my bills like to just be very very honest like when I was a classical musician for example I really wanted to be um a concert pianist and then wasn't able to figure out how to make that a viable enough living you know and um also at that time once I was done with school I knew I wanted to stay in the United States but I didn't have a green card like I grew up in Jakarta um and it was very important for me knowing my queerness to be able to live in a place where I can just express my queerness without um feeling like my safety is threatened so I had to kind of shift you know and um one of the best things that have ever happened to me was landing my current day job because it you know I was so allergic to the idea of like being a corporate worker my dad was a banker and um it felt like the furthest thing from like my who I know myself to be, which is a creative person, an artist, a mystic, right? And yet having that day job taught me so much about success. Like right now, if I look at my skill sets in life, I have music, which is my deepest passion. And I studied for so many years. Like I have so much qualification to like do music um, in this lifetime. And then I have my mystical endeavors, right? Like astrology, um, tarot. I also do the I Ching, you know, and all that stuff, right? The Akashic work that you and I are connected through. And then I have this like day job, you know? And to be really honest with you, if I look at my level of expertise or like my level of craft, I would say I am most fluent in music. I am really, really good at doing my mystical stuff. And I'd say I'm like very average at my day job. And yet, guess what? Like more than 60% of my income comes from my day job because my day job is an, is an, an industry that makes a lot of money. So that taught me something really important about success, which I think is a module that is missing for a lot of creative people. Like a lot of creative people feel this pressure to make a lot of money doing their creative work because that having that amount of money is going to validate their um like calling or their 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 vocation, right? Their service to the world. But I think that's completely the wrong way to think about it. I am not here to poo-poo on people having dreams. Like I have dreams to be a full-time creative too. But I am not going to um, I'm not going to equate my calling and my skills in like the things that I'm good at and that I know I'm called to in this lifetime with my success because it's not the right way to look at it in my opinion. Sometimes success comes from and especially when we think about success in terms of like financial or uh getting the stamp of approval of authority or getting a lot of following, these are all external metrics. So if that's your definition of success, if you want a lot of money, you need to find a field that has a lot of money and you need to be able to tap into it. Like that's just the Saturnian grid of the matrix, right? If you want to have a lot of following, you need to say something that people can resonate with. If you want to have the stamp of approval of authority, you need to figure out what the authority wants and then give it to them. And so if we use these conventional metrics of success to validate our creative calling, there's an inherent tension there. And I think that we will cause so much less suffering for ourselves as creative people if we just like let that go, mm. right? Like I understand we need to make money. I understand we need some level of approval from authority figures. We need to have some level of following. I think what we need to do, at least from my mercurial self, is like to 
kind of approach that in a more healthy way, you know, be like, okay, this project wasn't successful, but can I internally affirm for myself that the reason why it wasn't successful wasn't my fault? It wasn't the fault of my creative calling. Like I wasn't called to the wrong thing. I simply was doing something that maybe didn't have as much resonance in the market yet. So what can I do in order to either create that resonance, right? Or if I'm strapped for cash, just create something that I know people want and need, you know? There's no shame in that, right? So yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? I'm curious what's coming up for you as I'm sharing all of that. I think it's brilliant. I think everyone needs to understand success is different for everyone. Just like we have so many different people, like there are different ways to be a happy, successful adult. That's kind of like the theme of my podcast. And like, I want people to understand there is just so much more out there. Something that my therapist really helped me do, because like a lot of what I've been um, working on in this time is like, like creating anyway regardless of what the outcome is, it's just the creation is what matters. And my therapist um, pointed out to me, he's like the energetic exchange with the universe is when you create the thing. It's not when it gets accolades and acclaim. Mm -hmm. And something that has also really resonated for me and kind of buttressed that is like my favorite Prince album is like Lotus Flower, uh, Minneapolis Sound. And that came out in like 2010, but I didn't really discover it till 2020, 2021. So like 10 years Mm -hmm. later, I'm discovering this thing that Prince created back then. Right. And so it's like, I know it was interesting because like in early in his career, he was really in the pop frequency, like in the Mm -hmm. flow of like, what does pop want? And and I think he was really creating for that. And then eventually like he shifted, like I've just listened to so many of his interviews and like he shifted to really focusing on a body of work. And I love that. And I love that yeah. for us. And I love that, like, to see someone who was a brilliant creative create ahead of his time and not care, you know? Mm. And, like, and I think he cared probably a little bit at the time because he wanted to, like, make millions, but he also recognized the fallacy of the music industry. So he started pulling out the middleman. Mm-hmm. He could make more money from his work, which he totally deserved to do. Yeah. And I just think it's, it, you know, again, like, we're in this new time where, like, it's all about, like, having the relationship with your fans of people who support your work. And uh, when I help someone start their Patreon page, like I'm always talking about, like, this is a place for you to create and flow and evolve with your most supportive fan base, because they're the ones that want to pay money for you to keep going. And like, um, I think the vast people who support my Patreon don't even come to my aerobics classes. Like they're just supporting me because they want me to keep talking and working and creating and yes. they're rooting for me to win and I'm grateful for it. And yes. so like, I don't know. And like, and it's really interesting too. I talked about this in a couple episodes ago um, in a solo episode about my podcast. Cause like I have, you know, like everyone, I know almost every entrepreneur I know in 2023, like had money flow, like not flowing for them. And like, mm-hmm. so realizing like, oh, I was so grateful um, to be able to live off of mostly my Patreon and then a couple, you know, a few gigs here and there. And like a lot of it dried up and like the extra gigs kind of dried up more than they had before. And so I was like, oh, I, you know, so I took on a cleaning job, which I would do once a week now. And like, and then realizing like, oh shit, I got to take on another job. But instead of working retail, now I'm pet sitting. And that's been like shut off like a rocket. So it's like, it's actually been really great. And I'm allowing more miracles to flow through me by like shifting the path. And it's like divine timing and divine flow want to work, but they don't have just one way to work. Like there's like thousands of different possible ways. So like if we're caught up in like one outcome, because we're taught one metric of success, like it stifles the creative spirit, which is not what God wants. God just wants that's just fucking around and finding out like exactly exactly yeah Mm -hmm. I hear a couple things that I really appreciated from what you shared Bevin one was I heard um this invitation to define success for yourself I think that's really really important I think that um involving the body as well in like the process of defining that success is very interesting for a lot of people because I think for a lot of us we have guarded ourselves 
us ourselves against our own body's responses, right? So like you and I, right before uh, we started recording, we were talking about peace, right? And how that's one of your definitions of success. You know, peace is not really a definition of success in like the capitalist like list, you know, like no one's like, oh, you know, just find your peace of mind. Like that's not really something that is widely acknowledged maybe in the culture we live in, especially in the United States. But it doesn't mean that that's not valid, right? And it's really important for some people. For others, they may want to be really busy. They may want to feel really important and they may want to feel really connected with like their communities. And uh, these are all really valid ways of being successful. Another thing that I heard from what you're saying, it's actually kind of slipping away from my mind right now. Let me see if I can like retrieve this. Um, I don't know. It's like floating away. Maybe we can like come back to it at some point. But I think it's something along the lines of. Um... Oh, yes. Something about unshaming the ways that we are creative, because sometimes we are being called to be creative in terms of listening to the vision or the original inspiration that came through us and then doing it exactly the way that we saw it in our minds, right? But other times we're also being called to be creative in a sense of like, oh, I only have like, you know, a couple hundred bucks in my bank account and like, let me create something. Let me put my creativity towards like reopening that channel for flow of money, you know? And to me, there's no one right way to be creative, I think this is one of the biggest fallacies that we've kind of latched onto in our colonial Western mind, right? That there's one right way to be successful. There's one right way to be creative. But the reality is sometimes your creativity looks like being really faithful to the original vision. And other times your creativity is going to take you on a journey and you're going to come up with something that is totally unexpected for you you know, and for everyone around you. And what you said about like picking up different jobs and like allowing yourself to be supported through the different ways that Bevin can Bevin in this world, you know, is so liberating. Like to me, that's like liberation. Like um, this is making me think about a recent conversation I was reading between uh, Rick Rubin and Jacob Collier because Rick Rubin in the creative act was talking a lot about how for him creativity comes from within right or like let me rephrase that it's more that he was talking about how creativity comes from this like outside channel and the job of the creative is to block off other people's expectations so that they can execute as purely as possible and i definitely see and resonate with that perspective. But then Jacob Collier said something about how for him, his whole career has been built upon noticing what his supporters want and need from him. And actually doing something like taking that as a starting point for inspiration and then essentially like blowing everybody out of their minds, right? Um, by delivering something that is taking into account those expectations, but elevating it. So I think in a sense, right, there's so many different ways to be creative. There's not just one way to be creative. And I think part of actually being a creative person is allowing yourself to be creative in multiple different ways. Ooh, I love that. I also think there's something to like, just learning the self and learning what sparks you. Because like when I, yeah. you know, I'm still kind of a baby in human design, but like, <laughs> learning that I was a responding generator. And that means that I get ideas in response to external stimuli. I'm like, oh, yeah. it makes it more of a conversation. And it does make sense. Cause like, you know, one of my favorite ways of self-expression is just getting dressed. And so I'll just vibe, like, how do I, who am I connecting with? And like, how do I want to present? Right. Like, mm. and, and so it's like, I don't know, in conversation with the world around us. And of course, the cre the work of the artist is to draw threads between things that people don't necessarily see. Yeah. Um, and I do think there's like something to like, I don't know, there's various rivers, I think that you can get connected into a flow because I'll find that like, I'll get an idea that someone else also has and that someone else is also having like, in, you know, kind of you know, maybe a soul resonance pod. I don't even know what to call it, but like, yeah. 
but like, I think that our flow is different than like other people and other people are like more in the, like, you know, taproot to the water that feeds everyone. Like that's pop, right? Like that's the stuff that like everyone is, is vibing with in whatever way and however, um, Okay, Jonathan, I wanted to talk to you about unmet needs. Um, as a fellow student of Leah Garza, yes. did you identify any unmet needs during the Akashic mentorship and how did those, how are you meeting them potentially now? Um, that's a deep question, that is. <laughs> it is um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to share something that's like a little vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I think for me, one of the deepest unmet needs was being seen as the creative being that I am and allowed to express that creativity without any resistance, you know? Um, I think because of how I grew up, I was always very scared of expressing my full creative self because I was taught to be thoughtful of other people and considerate. And I think I was also like a very sensitive kid. Like I feel other people's discomfort sometimes more acutely than they, they feel their own, you know? And, um, so for me, I think that what I identified during that period was how much my own creative force wants to be witnessed by me and wants to be held and reassured by me. And during the mentorship, I actually ended up um, creating my own course, which wasn't really like, I mean, I guess I always knew some somewhere along the way that I was going to do that but it wasn't something that I set out to do you know and I was always kind of like ah whatever you know but um meeting myself there meeting myself in the desire to to share and teach what I know and my own practice to other people and it was actually a course on Mars um which you and I have been talking about throughout this conversation so um yeah, I think meeting myself there in that desire to share with others and to even like play the teacher role was like, it felt really risky. It felt really scary and it still feels scary, you know? But I think what I learned from the Akashic mentorship was that I get to experiment with this idea that I am inherently good and that I get to affirm my own unmet needs you know and like there's something about I think there's something about like how my unmet needs probably had to do with like being able to share my creativity and have other people really affirm that you know, and like, tell me, tell me back to my face, like, wow, what you did or what you created really meant something for me, you know, and it's, it's kind of a tricky territory to navigate, right? Because I think there is a story around how being a good teacher or being a good facilitator means like removing yourself out of the equation. But the reality is, I think we all need to find our own like the balance that's right for us, you know? I guess in this moment, I'm curious too, Bevin, about your experience with that because with your um, aerobics offerings, I'm curious if like you found two different ways to allow yourself to be seen. You know, I'm also looking at like your Jupiter in Leo, you know, which is, you know, pretty closely um, placed to my south node in Leo. Um, yeah, I'm curious how that's like resonating for you and, and what are some of the ways in which you've allowed yourself to be seen, even as you are being the facilitator of other people's processes? 
Ooh, good question. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say like, thank you for being vulnerable on my podcast, mm. telling us about your unmet needs. Cause I think that's like, really is like the key to unlocking so much for us is like recognizing like what in us is unmet and how can we, yeah. you know, yeah. and, like, yeah. I think, you know, I just want to support you continuing to create, 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 and like, just, you know, release the consequences, like the outcomes, just create for the sake of creating, because we need it. Mm. Um, and so I have Jupiter and Lilith conjunct in the 11th house. So it's like very much like community and on stage and, um, and teaching though, you know, from that space, because Jupiter is the teacher. Um, yeah. I think that, uh, I don't know, it's like inviting people to aerobics is like truly one of the most sacred things I can do. And I know it's kind of funny because like I started the thing and I was like, okay, here's this thing. Come do this thing with me. This is what I've been like building up to my whole life. Like I was a drag performer and before that I was a camp counselor. Mm -hmm. So like various places being on stage. And this is a way where I'm on stage, but I'm really inviting people to embody a practice with me. It's like, instead yeah. of like, watch me do this thing, it's like, please, let's do this thing together. Um, and like, I'm just so passionate about like the outcome for it, that like the outcome for other people, like the healing that I get to offer um, as I like knock things off my table. Um, but like, the, I'm so passionate about it that like, I don't feel cringe about being on stage but like mm. it's so funny because every time I reach into like a new level of artistic vulnerability like a couple of years ago I like got the idea to do love cats by the cure and so it was house cat aerobics and mm. um which was like I was like we're gonna be very foolish I like lean into the silliness and play in some of my numbers far more than I did when I was cool girl LA teaching this aerobics class. Like now I'm like forest, uh, which won't brush her hair, you know, like, so, um, <laughs> my, uh, my friend Ginger came up with like a Spotify day list, which is like mountain, witch won't wash her, hair, won't brush her hair. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm Saturday to it. yeah. Um, so like now that I'm that, like, it's like, I'm really leaning into the silliness. Cause like part of moving your body is it feels awkward and silly. Right. So like yeah. having people pretend to be a house cat is like very awkward and silly. And then one of my most judgmental neighbors, um, walked by like, you know, like checking our electric meters. So like heard me like, of course, like of all the times she could have come during my aerobics class while we're doing house cat aerobics. But I was like, you know what? This is the first time I've done it. And this could be not more cringe than it is right now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. whatever to be cringe is to be free. And so I just, I don't know, I guess I kind of lean into it. And in many ways, mm -hmm. I'm just so passionate about it. And like passion comes from doing right. Like you don't get passionate mm -hmm. about something the first time you do it. Like you create passion over time by devoting yourself to a practice. And yeah. so it's like, I'm so devoted to this thing that I'm never going to not do. Like I intend mm -hmm. to teach this class three times a week till the day I die. And, um, I like, so I'm so passionate about it. I don't even pause to consider like what it's like other than like wanting it to be accessible and fun. Those are the two primary values of my aerobics class. And so, yeah. um, so I don't know, I think that's like how that Jupiter and Leo like shows up, um, mm. at work. I do Beautiful. feel far more vulnerable about my podcast and like my really? blog. Yeah. Cause I feel like they're like more public consumption. Like people have to like mm. really choose to show up and embody like minimum participation for my aerobics class is just showing up and sharing along. So like people can come to an in-person class and sit in a chair and I've had that happen before. I had someone blow out her knee, like then the first, like, you know, my stretches are very low key, but like her knee was tender. And so like her, her knee just was not having it within like the first 10 minutes of class. So she sat, and like, just, you know, did chair aerobics while we were doing it, but she felt totally welcome to be there. This was in Austin in like 2018. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just interesting. Cause I'm like, yeah, just show up. Who cares? Right. Like I'm not grading you <laughs> like this is for you, you know, and I yeah. think things I have to say are, are worthwhile. So like, please mm -hmm. show up and be part of the energy. Cause I think every yeah. class now that I've taught like more than 800 classes, I'm like, every class has been unique because of the unique energy of the people who come. Right. And right. like, it's almost never the same group of people. And, um, and, the, and I think, and it's, of course, everyone's in the new now moment. So like, we're all different. I'm different. Like I'm different every two weeks with the moon cycles. I'm like, dang, I've grown mm -hmm. some more, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's like, 
we're just all creating something together at, in that moment. It's really special and fun. And I'm so grateful to get to do it. Oh, I really love that share. First and foremost, thank you for sharing that. And also for me, what's coming up is like how we are, when it comes to visibility, I think a lot of us are scared. We have our own very unique um, stories of fears and like there are different like different mediums make us feel differently. Like, for example, I, I'm noticing as you were speaking that I'm kind of the opposite. Like for me, people listening to my podcast or like coming across my Instagram, it's like I don't feel responsible for these people because I'm literally just like spewing things out. Like for me, it's like, look, dude, if you want to judge me or if you're going to say something nasty on my on my page or like my platform, I'm literally just going to block you. Same. You know, like you you didn't pay for this. Like, bye right like I don't feel any vulnerability around that but I do feel more vulnerable and maybe a little bit more responsible for like people who did pay for my offerings like there's something about that exchange that makes it more vulnerable I guess yeah mm -hmm. interesting ah oh, I because I feel like once people for me I guess I mean I feel very responsible like I when I teach aerobics like it's funny, I was listening to someone's podcast and they were talking about when they're on stage, I feel very anxious and like mm. about everyone's experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I will say like, I feel, I think that anxiety probably comes out of responsibility, but for me, I just feel responsible. You know what I mean? And mm. like, I'm going to do my best to create this space and like, you know, a hundred percent of the time people leave my class and they're smiling. So like that to me, yeah. is, I'm, joy is my work product. So here we've had a joy. <laughs> And you know, I'm a witch and I understand the physiology of high performance. So I know what I need to do with your body to release the junk and to bring in the joy, like let's mm -hmm. start alchemy. But um, anyway, yeah, it's just interesting how like we can all, we all have our tenderness and it's okay. Yeah. And it's just kind of navigating the tenderness without like, and the vulnerability without letting it like stop you. Right. Totally. Like, and, and just allow, like I, every solo podcast I publish, I feel totally cringe about, but mm. I have this like rule for myself that I can't go back and unpublish. Like, and, um, and I finally, like my last, uh, episode that was solo, I let myself do it for Patreon. Cause it just felt like it was too much of an active wound and not enough scar tissue for me to like yeah. talk about it. And yeah. I was like, I'm going to let this be for the Patreon babes who like really want to support me. And I know, um, you know, just deserve a little bit more tenderness, you know? So, totally. um, Jonathan, now that people are, let's wind up this conversation. Cause we're going to talk again on your podcast and I'm going yes, to, I'm going to have you back on my podcast. You're going to be a regular, but I want to tell people now, since they're listening to their podcast app, where can they go to get subscribed to your podcast? Sure. Uh, they can just type in Healing the Spirit. I think that's the only podcast. My podcast is the only one called Healing the Spirit. Um, and yeah, just come find me. I show up every week, sometimes twice a week when I have the, the energy. Um, and yeah, usually on Mondays, I share um, any thoughts, reflections, contemplations about like inspired by the astrology, but usually just like whatever's really coming up for me. And then um, on like later during the week, I usually have conversations with, yeah, with friends and colleagues and um, humans like you who I love and admire. And I was talking to a friend actually um, about this earlier, about how like I, it, it may not seem like it because I have so many conversations uh, published and shared on the podcast, but like I actually i'm pretty picky about like who gets that who i talk to on the podcast and i really only talk to people that i like care about you know people whose work and whose presence i find inspiring and like i appreciate their presence in the world so anyways i, I don't know i, I don't want to sound gatekeepy there but i think what i'm trying to say here is that like these conversation spaces for me on the podcast is very sacred because um yeah i i i feel like um conversations are a lot more 
revealing than people often recognize, you know? Like there's something about conversations that I think open us up to deeper intelligence wanting to move through us. And I approach that process with a lot of care and also a lot of levity and also a lot of fun. But I do think that um, it deserves the kind of thoughtfulness um, that goes into that process. Yeah. For, for whatever reason that wants to be said here. So, yeah. Love that. Um, I don't think it's gatekeeping to have like, and, and I don't think it's actually bad to be gatekeeping about your work and who you want to connect with on your podcast. Like yeah. I call this Bevan and her friends, Bevan a femme over 40 and her friends podcast. Cause I wanted to interview my friends. Cause my friends are like, you know, my favorite form of wealth. I think wealth comes mm -hmm. in lots of things, but like over this lifetime, like, wow, I've like met so many cool people who are like doing life and creating success for themselves in a way that's very like sometimes the same as like what society wants us to believe, but a lot of times mm. it's really different. And I just want yeah. like, especially like people who are coming out of like fundamentalist thought frames, like whether mm -hmm. that's religious or like, even I think like body oppression is a form of fundamentalism. You know, it's like a yeah. one way to think about bodies and actually there's lots of ways and totally. be free. Right. So anyway, I love that. And you know, it's, we if if someone is going to trust you with their time one of their most precious resources like you have standards you know mm -hmm. like what you want to share on the podcast and I love that yeah um thank you for being here thank you for sharing yourself with us and I can't wait to have you on the podcast again and see what comes up in our episode on your uh yeah healing the spirit podcast I couldn't remember the name of it I was like, it's Jonathan. Gunn. I know it's it's actually like <laughs> such a funny and weird name, Bevin, and it's like it's kind of the bane of my existence because, and you know, those who listen to my podcast may know this, but I literally got it from the Akashic Records. Oh, like I got it because so I had another name that I wanted, but I found out like about maybe three weeks before actually launching the podcast. This was back in 2022. Um, that there was another podcast with a very similar name. So I was very hesitant to use that that other idea. And so then I asked the records and they gave me Healing the Spirit. And I, I had a lot of um, feelings about it because I was like, it kind of sounded like, you know, like one of those like 60s hippies, like project, you know? <laughs> like I had judgment arising out of me about that. And um I think for me, part of the work has been like really using the podcast as a project to discover what that even means. Because like, what does that even mean? Like, what does it mean to heal the spirit? You know, I don't know if I know the answer. I don't know if there's like one answer, but I think it's a question to like live into, you know? So, yeah. Oh, I love it. And I, the records are right. Like, here's the thing. It's like, you know, they can't predict with accuracy, but the vibe is there. You know what I mean? And I, mm. anytime I've ignored my intuition, like I can look back and see, oh, you were right. You know, like, so I'm just going to trust it. My intuition surprises me all the time. Anyway. Okay. Bye, Jonathan. I love you. Bye, Bevan. I love you too. <laughs>